everyone, my name is Sam, and thanks for checking out this video. Make sure to hit the subscribe button down below, put the little bell notification button on, and give the video a thumbs up. As always, I want to talk about the books that I read this week, and I actually had a really fantastic reading week this week. I think I finished seven books, and I'm only, like about halfway through another one today that I just didn't get finished. So I read a lot this week, part of the reason being that I had dental surgery earlier, so I had a couple days off work, so I got lots of reading done. First things first, I finished my reread of Reign of the Fallen by Sarah Glenn Marsh. I had the opportunity several months ago, uh, in October 2017, to read the arc, and I really, really enjoyed that book, and actually Sarah Glenn Marsh is going to be in the TBR and Beyond book group for a live chat, and is doing some giveaways for the character cards, which were pre-order swag, so if you want to join on that, I've linked the group in the description down below, but follows a... The story of a necromancer, and it's lots of LGBTQ representation, so it's great for Pride Month especially. And I honestly love this story. There's a lot of grief, there's a lot of processing, and a lot of growth in the characters, and obviously the representation is fantastic to see, and I don't know, like, I just... I feel like it's one that everyone should really, really read. I've, I've, I'm actually floored by the kind of the rating on Goodreads right now. I think it's like 3.4. I hardcore disagree with it. I gave it a 5.5 at, uh, or 5 out of 5 stars when I read the arc, and I gave it a 5 point, oh my god, a 5 out of 5 stars again on my reread. I really, really loved it. There's lots of travel. There's betrayal in it, but, you know, I guess everyone's got their own taste, but I would very highly recommend this series. I'm not a big fan of like death and necromancy necessarily, but I feel like this book was just very fun and really, really cool getting to go into like kind of the in-between world and all that kind of stuff. Then I blew through China Rich Girlfriend by Kevin Kwan. This is the second book in the Crazy Rich Asians trilogy. I'm obsessed with this series. I'm total trash for it. And this book threw me for a loop. I, I didn't know that this was going to happen because of the way China or Crazy Rich Asians was, it was very focused on Nick and Rachel's relationship and the family drama that's behind all that, whereas this one focused a lot more on Kitty and a little bit more on Astrid, I feel like, and there were parts of it that made me rage, but I love the drama. I, like, just like the first book, I think I read it in, like, maybe six-ish hours or so. I didn't put it down the whole time, and I'm really excited for the third book. I anticipate the whole, um, like, uh, what's it called when you leave things? Not bequeathments? Uh, but when you leave things, inheritances. <laughs> because it is brought up in here to try and lure Nick away from marrying Rachel. And I loved it. I'm kind of sad that there wasn't a big, like, proposal moment in the books. It was given as, like, a history thing. But nonetheless... I love that we got to see some other characters a little bit more because I love Nick and Rachel, but the other characters have some serious drama and there's so much going on and Astrid left me so heartbroken at the end of the first one. So really happy and really, really excited to see where the third book goes and I'm definitely reading it next month if I don't sneak it in this month. Oh, I gave it a five out of five stars. I don't know if I said that. Then I read Paper Princess by Aaron Watt. This is the first book in the Royals. I think it's a quartet now. And this had been recommended to me by a couple people that said it was very gossipy girl, very contemporary, drama-y trash, which I wasn't totally sold on that. But I love the covers, and I figured I loved Crazy Rich Asians, and that's all kind of contemporary family drama, so maybe this will work for me. And I had someone actually was really, really sweet message me on Goodreads saying she loves this book, and she really hoped that I would read it soon. So I bumped it up my TBR a little bit. And I kind of regretted it. I'm happy someone else loved this book, so I don't want to take away from that. But this book is problematic as hell. It's following the story of Ella, who's a 17-year-old pretending to be older, stripper, who's trying to pay her way through life after her mother has died, and she doesn't know who her father was, she never met him. And then all of a sudden, some random guy shows up at her school and is like, your parents are dead, I'm now your legal guardian, and he explains that he found the letter that Ella's dying mom sent to her dad, but her dad had since kind of immediately passed away afterwards, so he's taking on that role now. And then he takes her back to his family house, which I don't even understand why you would be a guardian for someone if your family system is so unhealthy as this was, but he has, I think, five sons. I honestly couldn't tell you 
which one is which. They're basically all of the same. There's so little character development done on all this. There's nonstop sex and not, I'm all for it. You know, I love me some Outlander, but it literally makes no sense. It's just used nonstop in this book. Ella is bl very blatantly at the beginning says that this person is bad for her and that she's continuously attracted to him. Then they start randomly hooking up, but then he kind of does this whole, like, don't get close to me, you'll get hurt kind of bullcrap. And then at the end, there's family drama with the dad and uh, his kind of girlfriend at the time. And I, I le legitimately don't get the appeal of this book. It's just so problematic. The massive straw for me was someone gets drugged in this book, Ella, and is almost raped. And then she goes home with the guy that she's not supposed to be attracted to because that's her brother. They live in the same house. But she is. And then they start doing stuff because she needs to get out. It, same thing. You're still intoxicated. He also pretends to tries to tell her that if she wants to do anyone in the family, she has to do him and not the rest of his family. I don't, that didn't make any sense whatsoever. And then so she ties him up and then he gets all aroused and then she leaves because she was playing him. And it's her fault that he got aroused. So he goes to punch people. I'm sorry. What? Yeah, I, I just, no, no. Give this one out of five stars. I very rarely give one out of five stars. Immensely problematic. I won't be keeping this book and I'm not going to continue on with the series whatsoever. Then I did a read of Mockingjay by Suzanne Collins. This will be, well, I guess this is, the completion of my reread of The Hunger Games this year. I actually remember hating this book because of the ending. It's kind of the conclusion to the whole rebellion against the capital. And if you've read it, you know why. There's a massive death at the end and everyone was like, what the heck was the point of this book to begin with then? And I was along that wavelength. However, in the past several years, I feel like I've grown an awful lot with my reading. And when I get to books now where basically everyone lives, I'm kind of like, that, that, that doesn't seem right. Something's off. You know, you just overthrew a dictator dystopian country. There shouldn't, it, it's not likely that you're all going to live, okay? And you're all going to come out happily ever after. So I actually kind of appreciated what this book did. My only kind of drawback is I didn't like the epilogue. It was just kind of like a thrown in there ever after. Um, and it didn't seem like that was true to Katniss's character by that we, we'd known through this whole book. If there was some explanation of like a few years after the rebellion, this is what happened and Katniss kind of changed or grew up a little bit and Peeta grew up or like just something else to kind of in between the ending and the epilogue, maybe it would have made sense, but otherwise... Not crazy about that epilogue part. But I think it ended up giving me a four out of five stars. I didn't hate it as much as I did the first time. And I'm actually really excited that the 20th, I guess, or 10th anniversary of it is coming up, which is really excited for this series. Then I read The Star-Touched Queen by Roshani Chotsky. This is the first book in, it's a duology, I believe. And I have the second book. I think I'm going to read the second book next month. I really, really love this cover, first of all, the like in the background. I honestly don't know that I totally understood the plot overall. I, it's kind of hard to regurgitate, but she is forced by her father to marry someone who kind of ends up being like death and like they get control over people's, well, not control, they're kind of responsible so that people, you know, people have to die, right? So it's kind of that and, but there's lots of betrayal and she gets kind of tricked several times, which I think is what confused me the whole time. I couldn't keep track of it. But the writing is beautiful. It's, uh, despite everything going on, I felt myself very calm and collect. And, like, this author had put so much time into, like, weaving this story. And, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I may want to reread it in the future just to make sure I comprehend everything that happened. Because I just, I, I legit probably can, couldn't really explain it to you. <laughs> But I think in the end, I gave it like a four out of five stars, just because, like I said, didn't totally understand the whole thing. It was a little bit gray. Maybe it was just my reading mood or whatever. But I really enjoyed it nonetheless, and the writing was beautiful, and I'm really excited to read The Companion, I think it is. Then I read To Kill a Kingdom by Alexandra Christo. I said her name right. I keep calling it, trying to say Alexis. But this is a standalone, actually, or at least it is currently labeled as such. But it's kind of a Little Mermaid kind of situation. It follows the story of Princess Lyra, who is a siren, not a mermaid. Apparently, there's a very distinct 
division between the two in this book and she is the daughter of a pretty wicked queen and she pisses off her mom during some events in here and her mom sends her to shore without uh you know as kind of a human to i don't know kind of i don't know how to explain it quite well like to punish her where she meets prince elian elian and this whole time princess lyra on her birthday every year has been taking the heart of one prince so prince Elian is on the hunt kind of for the siren this whole time. He's technically the heir to the crown, but he is much more of a pirate. He wants to be out adventuring and learning, and he wants to get this siren because the most recent woman or the most recent prince that was killed was was was, a, was someone he knew and kind of really respected. And they interact with Prince Lyra and Elian without knowing that who Princess Lyra is, and they have to go through this kind of long adventure to cast capture this kind of secret medallion which would solve or kind of throw into chaos the conflict going on between the mermaids and the sirens and the humans. And I'm actually very amazed for the standalone how much was covered in this, how slowly and gradual I felt like the romance was. It didn't seem quite as insta-lovey to me, which I was honestly very assuming that it was going to happen because it is a standalone and it's a little mermaid. But I feel like it was actually quite gradual, the growth between, you know, Lyra at the beginning when she's an angry siren to when, you know, she makes a big choice at the end on who to side with. And I actually really enjoyed it. I loved the magic. I liked kind of the really dark tone because I've read parts of the older, like, Grimm Brothers that we take and Disneyfy, and oh my god, they're dark because they taught, you know, scared children into learning lessons and stories in, like, the 1700s or whatever. So I feel like that stayed a little bit more true to kind of like the Grimm Brothers, Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales that we base a lot of things and like kind of lighten up like bubblegum it. So I actually really enjoyed this. I can give this like a four out of five stars as well. And last but not least, I read The Son of Neptune by Rick Wright Orton. This is the second book in the Heroes of Olympus series. And I'm pretty, pretty trucking along. I think I'll be able to finish the series by the end of the year, which I'll be really happy with. It wasn't on my 2018 goals, but it kind of kept coming up and I finally got the box set. This story follows Percy, who kind of has the same thing happen to him as it happened to Jason in the first book, where his memory has been wiped. He can remember bits and pieces of Annabeth and he, you know, he's living in a Greek world. No, sorry. He's living in a Roman world as a Greek um, you know, demigod, but they don't totally understand things, and he knows that there's conflicts going on, and it's the same conflicts going on in the first book where there was Jason with, you know, death and, like, the underworld gods, and, you know, there's Zeus kind of cutting off Olympus to everyone, so it's kind of a continuation of that, but we meet Percy Jackson instead, well, we're kind of reintroduced to Percy Jackson, and then we meet a new character, Hazel, who was kind of brought back from the dead, and... Oh, what's the other kid's name? Frank. And uh, he's kind of kind of underappreciated, I guess. He doesn't think much of himself either. And or his powers. And you both you, you get to follow them as they go on this quest. And I actually found the most interesting character to be Hazel, because you get the multiple timelines, because she is from the 1940s, and she kind of has referen leaves references to like life like at the kind of the beginning of World War II, living in New Orleans. And then you get to go to, as well as when she was in kind of like death, and you, you know she's hiding a secret, but she's brought back from the underworld. And I just loved her story and loved her character. So I think I would give this book another, I think it was another four out of five stars. I actually really, really enjoyed Hazel, like, so, so much. I think I enjoyed the first book more, just because part of my love of Percy Jackson is the trio of it, of, of the satyr and Annabeth and Percy. And two of them weren't there, but you kind of get in passing, like his Cyclops brother kind of pops up at the end and that kind of stuff. So I'm hoping to see more of them in the third book. And yeah, I'm going to keep working on this series. So those are all the books that I read this week. Let me know in the comment section down below if you've read any of these and what you thought or what you read this week. I would love to hear. Make sure to check the description box down below for links to all of the books as Goodreads pages, as well as links to all of my social media. If you follow me, I will follow you back.